Hi, I'm Wayne Tuttle and welcome to Chasing Legends. Welcome back to Chasing Legends. I'm Wayne Tuttle. I'll be your host again yet this week. Please hit subscribe, hit the comments, leave a comment, hit the notification bell to know when our next video is. Uh, go to the About section. You'll find our t-shirts. Legends, Superstition Mountains, Dutch Hunter Rendezvous, Black and Gray, Long Sleeve, Short Sleeve. Comes in all sizes. Please go over there. We don't make a dime. Um, yada, yada, yada. Getting to this week, you will notice the production's changed a bit. Um, production's changed because Trevor and Tyler are off. Um, Trevor's finishing up his bachelor's degree here shortly and all the equipment left. So I am now back to the iPhone days and we will be kind of shooting off with the iPhone and I'll be sending this off into the nether and the boys will be picking it up and putting the show together um, remotely and posting it up. So it's up to me to kind of carry things here production wise. So I hope everybody enjoys it. Hope everything's in focus and everything sounds just right. So this week I wanted to go a little different angle. And part of that angle was I get asked questions. Will you cover this? Will you talk about this? Or I get asked questions. And I get those, asked those quite a bit about particular subjects. And I kind of tell Trevor I want to kind of, maybe I'll catch this sometime. And we talked about it and talked about it. And I always look for more and more information. I always try to put a lot of research in, look for some books, some stuff I, I really kind of, kind of can explore all sides of the story on. And the story at this time is a story done by Prometheus Productions on History Channel, Skinwalker Ranch. Um, the first pun and evolved is there appears to be no skinwalkers. They utilize actually the title similar to the Oak Island thing, you know, Seven Must Die, and yet a production member has died on the island. Several people have passed away, and they still keep saying the Seven at the beginning. It's just kind of a nice, nice tag. Well, the Skinwalker Ranch, it's a great sounding name. I mean, calling it the Sherman Ranch or the Myers Ranch or Bigelow Ranch or ranch or whatever the guy's name is just doesn't have the same ring so skinwalker ranch sounds great so you kind of get the title but a lot of people ask me kind of what are my thoughts um i know i got kind of thrown out you know um touched out by touched on by the um company that was doing um blind frog ranch and i kind of decided i didn't understand why i would want anything to do with it. it'd be great to visit and i've talked about that but here kind of moving forward it was yeah people want to know and, and i've looked at the skinwalker ranch a lot and there's an important distinction here. One of the things that's much different in the way I approach the things is most television programs really kind of give you that wall. And they might give you the three walls, but they're not going to break the fourth wall down. And I know with our program, we worked and struggled really hard to get them. And, and they did occasionally kind of start to lean that way. We did it several times where we argued something and kind of went against the creative writing direction and said what we were thinking in the moment is the direction we have to go. Um, and that's what I'd like to say is the two sides of a coin. A lot of times in programs, and yes, this is a silver coin, but they only show you the one side on the program. They don't want to give you what's on the other side. So you kind of learn basically most of the history and what they'll base it on. And it might be a popular book or two or a couple people. And in this case, um, George Knapp is um, one of the people I know, he wrote a book on Skinwalker Ranch, and they follow a lot of that information, which is oral history, and we're gonna cover that, because that's the one side of the coin, it. and it's important. I mean, it is important, but it's not showing you everything that's going on. They don't want to kind of go too in depth or spoil their own story, which is unfortunate, because sometimes balance actually makes you dig deeper and, and, and look for better truths. Now, the Sherman family buys a ranch. They want to raise cattle there. They buy it from the Myers family. Um, it was owned previously by Ken and Edith Myers. And um, they purchase it off the estate. They start to sell and put cattle. In the first instant, they have this big wolf thing shows up. And they talk about it. It's a gigantic looking wolf thing. It runs up. It doesn't seem to be ill-intentioned. They're not sure. And then it, it's kind of a little controversial there because they act like, well, they're not sure if it's an oversized dog or if it's a wolf or what it is, but then they try to make it bigger and bigger and bigger in the storytelling. It supposedly comes up and then tries to pull a calf through the fence and is trying to pull it through these uh, bars. And uh, Mr. Sherman grabs a two by four or something and he starts beating on it, shovel, he starts beating on it and won't let it go. 
So then he gets his 357 or his handgun, and it's a 357 in some stories, but he starts popping rounds into it, and he empties the chamber, and it does nothing. It doesn't even cause this thing to hesitate. So then he gets his hunting rifle and continues to just put rounds into it. Finally, it seems to blow a chunk off the animal, and then the animal stops, doesn't even seem hurt, seems to kind of look at them like it notices them for the first time, and then just turns and then slowly walks away off into the distance. And they're completely stunned. They're like, this thing's taking all these rounds and this beating, and it didn't even seem to be affected by it. So after they've recovered, they decide they're going to track this beast out across the property to see where it went. He chases, tracks the animal out, and he gets out, and it gets to a certain point where they can see the paw prints. I think it was by a marshy area, and then the paw prints just stop. Like, it is levitated and lifted in the air, and it's gone. So that's the first mysterious account. Um, the Shermans talk about how there were cabinets inside the house that had locks inside and outside, which just kind of drove them wild. How would you lock the cabinets from the inside? And it also, there were locks inside and outside of the doors, heavy deadbolts, padlocks and stuff on the front door and everything. It was like a fortress, the windows and shutters. And then I guess there were these big chains and collars, like for dogs, just to make sure that the animals couldn't get away. They must have, and they were thinking, what the heck's going on in this place? It's like, they, they got it closed down for like four locks and even the animals are chained up. There must be something particularly strange. So one of the next incidents they have is the spears. They see these spears moving around and they start to go look at them and the dogs take off after them. And they're whistling and they take off for a while and they can't find the dogs. Well, the next day they follow out to go find the dogs and they find these black spots where like they've been burnt to a crisp or something. They figure that had to be the two dogs. So they'd lost the dogs. This wolf thing had showed up. I don't think that I ever hear a story of it showing up again. And uh, so they got these mysterious stories, but there's more, there's always more. Again, let's always remember, this is all oral history from the Shermans and there's very few interviews. I found one interview with Mr. Sherman where he talks about this next object, which was they thought someone was out coming across the property in an RV. So he's kind of checking it out and going, who the hell's on my property in an RV? How'd they get on the property and what are they doing driving across the field? So he goes out to check it out and they find it's some sort of hologram kind of rectangular box thing floating off the ground moving around and has an opening or something in it. And that's where we get a lot of these UFO portal stories and things. And I guess this thing drifted around and moved around the property and they watched it for some time. What's very puzzling is with all these things and it continued and the spears happened a lot. They saw these floating spears and all this different stuff is there is, you know, unless, and, and, and there are a lot of people that claim Robert Bigelow claimed all this stuff, but there was no photographs, no video, no nothing. This is in the 90s, 1995 to 1970, 1997. So. All this occurs during this two year period. It's just like constant stuff. But there was one thing that became a final straw. And we'll get to that right now. So Sherman talks about they would hear disembodied voices and the voices seemed to be very aware they could hear them and laugh at them and they didn't know where they were coming from. There was an occurrence where there was a, a cow, he turned, he came back, the cow was mutilated and cut open and like surgical precision. Another one where he had the post hole digger and he was digging, he turned to wipe some sweat, turned back, it gone, and then they found it a month or so later in a tree. But the big one for him was they were going into town, they had several bulls out in the field, they drove out, when they came back the bulls are missing, they're looking around, looking around, finally they had this big metal um, storage container on the property. Um, it hadn't been opened in years, it was rusted, it had cobwebs all over it and stuff like that. So finally they went over, opened one of the hatches on it, looked down in it, and the bulls were in there. And they could not figure out how someone put the bulls in there, all the cobwebs and stuff were on it. They opened it up, the cows, bulls seemed like in a daze. He said he couldn't have got them in there normally, he could not have a clue, he had no explanation for it. I guess seeing his livelihood, the cattle mutilations, the missing dogs, all these different things stacked up, he was ready to go, he was ready to leave, there was noises outside. They, they had all these different occurrences supposedly that were noted afterwards. I think Bigelow reported most of them and George Knapp talked about them in his book. So then suddenly the Shermans want to sell and a gentleman by the name of Robert Bigelow steps in. And he's an interesting character into himself. Robert Bigelow is a billionaire hotel guy built hotels and motels everywhere and he made his money there and he's very interested in the paranormal UFOs and space travel stuff kind of think of um, Elon Musk and these guys and what they're doing now and because uh, I think he's working currently on some sort of um, 
lunar base thing that he wants to do to expand into and all. So he gets very interested in this. He buys the ranch off the Shermans. Um, and he goes forward in kind of what he's going to do. He's going to set up a facility and test for these things that have been happening to the Shermans because he's heard about something of a rumor of this stuff. So he goes out and sets everything up and he's going to kind of check out this place. I don't know when the name Skinwalker Ranch, it could have been that time. It could have been, it had to be around that era and the George Knapp era when George Knapp gets involved speaking with him. So he brings out some, all these scientists and you know some of them are known. Um, they have varying accounts. Um, some of the scientists say nothing really happened very much. Some say a lot of things happened. Um, there was one that talked about a bunch of rods they found there, and they said it was something to do with, you know, Area 51 and all. And then later another one said those rods were just these lead rods that are used for lighting and stuff. It had nothing to do with anything paranormal or UFOs or anything else. So you always get that contrary. You don't get that both sides of the tail. And they usually leave those stories out because you get those public kind of he said, she said type thing, or in this case, he said, he said. So Bigelow takes the whole place over. He runs for years, but Bigelow has a cool angle, one that we all have to appreciate. See, Robert Bigelow comes out of Nevada, and he's good friends with a gentleman named Harry Reid. You might remember Harry, senator, he's a pretty popular guy in politics and so forth, and Harry and him are buddies, and Harry's into the UFO stuff and all. And next thing you know is Bigelow gets some sort of contractor funding for his NIDS program that is like, I don't know, some exploration on the paranormal crap and UFOs. But the government's gonna fund him to study UFOs and the phenomena and stuff at the ranch. He made something 20, 22 million dollars doing this. So basically his pet project that he said he was personally interested in probably was more than well that was funded. He probably made a nice profit off of that. We don't know what they did because supposedly this funding is classified. So because they had a government funding and contract. What is kind of odd and puzzling to us all, and I think you will find this puzzling too, is at the end of the day, Harry Reid no longer was a senator, and then Bigelow suddenly said there was a lot less activity, and he sold the ranch to Brandon Fugel. Kind of, uh, I don't know, you know, it's kind of like the, 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 the money wagon ran out. I don't know, he'd, he'd, he'd dispute that, I'm sure. But it is kind of suspect that you were getting a lot of money and a lot of funding for this stuff. And when that guy's gone, the guy that kind of introduced this and was one of your key contact people, your buddy's gone, um, suddenly things change. So it moves on now to Brandon Fugel, um, everything else. And Brandon Fugel says, um, Bigelow won't give them anything, He's but he's going to do a TV show. Now, like I said, there's the podcast for Skinwalker Ranch with the producer, and he has Brandon Fugel, and he has um, the guy, their security guy named Dragon. We had we had the real deal Dalil, so I guess that's okay. But we had they have these different guys and they and they have them on and they talk to them about their phenomena. It's kind of a cool thing. If you're looking for anything you didn't see in the show, it's kind of a hype machine because they get to say, Oh yeah, the ranch's been extremely active this summer. And you know, well hopefully it'll be continue to be acting as we're filming, but they never tell you what's actually happening. Um, they're not filming, so they can't be setting it up for television. So you don't know whether they're going to use this script this somehow into the program or what the reason is. But they always talk how they're going to be so forthcoming and put everything out. Now they've talked for a while putting a website out with all the information and live camera feeds, which would be cool. They say they don't cover every inch of the, the, the compound because obviously they say they would cause a problem with some of the testing they're doing out there. So they, because of the, uh, the signals from the cameras. Um, I would think, you know, they could hardwire some stuff, but then they also claim, you know, all the wires are torn out and the cameras are disabled. They always got good excuses for why I'm doing this stuff. Anyways, Fugel gets this. Um, he ends up hooking up with Prometheus, which does Oak Island, which literally mirrors the show. We have the two brothers and a bunch of their friends. We have the guys on Skinwalker Ranch, and it's the guy that owns it and his friends. It's private property in both cases, which eliminates all these needs for permits. So these guys got pretty much free reign to run and do what they want to do. They don't have to get a lot of permission to do stuff, even though Oak Island has to get some, or so they say. Um, there's no need for an archaeologist or anything like that at Skinwalker Ranch. So they got all this stuff. But they have a number of things they talk about. They did talk about the chains, the door locks. They did talk about these things, and 
there's kind of, we run into some problems with some of the fiction, or non-fiction, what they claim, that they spewed on the show. One of the first problems is years ago, a gentleman who was neither a believer, non-believer, kind of an agnostic, kind of like where I fall into things, he ma managed to get an interview with a gentleman named Garth Myers. Now, Garth Myers was the brother of Kenneth Myers, the man who bought the ranch. Kenneth Myers and his wife Edith bought it back in about 1933. So they bought the ranch. They lived there until Kenneth died in 1987, and I believe Edith died in 1992. Garth had worked on the ranch, lived on the ranch with his brother and sister-in-law, and spent a quite a considerable time visiting him stuff. He was um, a pediatric neuros neurosurgeon, so he was a pretty smart cookie, um, spent time around them. They worked very hard on the, the farm or whatever they had, raising cattle and stuff. In the later years, they kind of subleased it out to people while they still lived there. Kenneth died in 1987. I believe his wife lived there at three or four years, and I might have gotten her death date wrong. She might have died around 94. I think she lived on the property until 92. So she stayed on the property until 92, and then she died in 94. 1994, everything changes, obviously. In 1994, Garth Myers began his two sisters become executors of the estate. For the next year or so, um, well, Garth had been taking care of things for the two years that his sister Edith had been off the property. He'd maintained and done and worked with the people who were leasing and so forth and helped manage the ranch for her in her absence as she was health reasons and so forth. And then he firsthand was dealing with stuff on the ranch and executed the ranch and everything and sold it to the Shermans. So Garth was quite involved the last probably three, four years of the ranch's existence. I'd be very familiar with it that before that, being a family member, his brother and sister-in-law lived there, he'd actually worked there. So we gotta kinda entrust Garth, and it's not like he's some bumpkin who lived in town or lived out of state or this and that, and, you know, had no true knowledge of anything, because Garth was family, and he took care of things when things were done. Well, Garth had a lot of puzzling things to say in his interview because they questioned him as the program and the TV shows coming out, and definitely about George Knapp's book and stuff. They wanted to ask Garth, well, what did you know about all this? Well, Garth kind of, it seems like he's half amused and half a little kind of ticked off because of all the stuff. He says, one, he repeatedly constantly said, his brother and sister never any, said anything about UFOs. He never saw anything when he was there, not when he lived there, not when he worked there, not when he took care of the ranch after that fact. Um, they had never mentioned anything. Some people act like, well, they just didn't want to tell you because maybe you were a non-believer, which is kind of BS in my opinion. So... Garth says none of that. In fact, when Bigelow purchased the ranch from the Shermans, he contacted Garth and talked to Garth and said, oh, you know, I, I, well, I want to know about all these stories. And Garth told him there is no stories. There was no story. And he said, oh, I've heard from people that your brother and your sister, and they said they talked about it. And he said, I've never, I never heard them tell a thing. I'm just telling you that they never said anything. I never saw anything personally on the property in the years I was there, when I worked there, lived there, and when I took care of it afterwards. This, all these UFO stories and all this stuff seemed to come after the Shermans had bought the ranch. And he said, I, his personal feeling seems to be that they were in over their heads and that became a thing. Um, Big Law, I guess, got mad, sent someone else to talk to Garth, and then Garth basically tried to make a deal, said, hey, you'll bring me out to the ranch, let me kind of go around the ranch, I'll talk to you guys all about stuff, and we'll walk around, do a tour, and I'll talk about anything I, I can bring up and tell you. They refused to allow him on the ranch, so he said, that's it, we don't need to talk no more. And that was the end of the Garth Myers in, in, um, involvement with Mr. Bigelow. However, Garth has a lot of other interesting things to say because they ask him questions like about the dogs and the dog chains and collars. And he said none of that was there. He never saw that stuff in the house. It never existed. Um, he said the front door, if you gave it a good kick, it would just go in. It wasn't locked that securely. You didn't have to push it far. There was no locks on the insides and outsides of the cabinets, nothing like that around the house. He said, in fact, um, the Myers, for most of the time they lived there, they'd had some dogs around, but the last dog that was there um, was basically a three-legged dog. It had an accident, lost a leg. He said it was a smaller dog with Edith, and it wasn't even there at the end. But he said there were never any bigger dogs like that, nothing like that ever at the ranch. So he kept disputing all this stuff, and uh, you can tell the guys, you know, it's a little incredulous because you think, wow, this is that whole mythology is just kind of like taking a dumpster dive that the Shermans not only did that, but people also kind of pushed it back on the Myers. 
and which is what happens in a lot of mythology. The Myers are both passed away. Garth Myers probably lived nowhere in the area. And nobody has any contact with them. And similar thing in the Dutchman legend with the Phil, um, um, Reinhard Patrash. Reinhard Patrash had so much stuff attributed to him, and even today people act like there's these oral histories and stories about him that are absolutely unfounded and true. Because simply, once the guy was gone and he was out of town, he had no way to back these things up. Very few people interviewed him. I think Barry Storm, Ralph Papps talked to him a little. Most people did not have a lot of interaction with him after he left Phoenix. So because of that, they could make up stuff and no one's going to dispute it because there was no family to do so. So one of the last things with Garth that's just absolutely just I loved was he was talking and they asked about not digging on Skinwalker because kind of like the seven dead on Oak Island and this thing there's the do not dig on Skinwalker Ranch. You're not allowed to dig on Skinwalker Ranch. You need permission to dig on Skinwalker Ranch. And he said he could care less. It's just they have to ask permission from him because they retained the mineral rights. Now, what's changed between Bigelow's time and that story and now with Brandon Fugel? Well, I'm sure those mineral rights may have passed on. I don't know, um, but they could have, or Prometheus and History Channel and Brandon Fugel could have made a deal with the relatives, the Myers family, the ex existing family members, to allow them to dig on the property, not in search of minerals, but to do testing and so forth, and they get paid. And you might say, well, that kind of sounds kind of interesting, but isn't that stretching things a bit? But oddly enough, it actually isn't. Um, the place my dad was born in Birchfield, West Virginia. He was born and raised there and lived there for quite a no number of years. Um, I am still receive, I, and it's not much, but there's a company that leases the mineral rights to that property. All the family members are involved. Um, there's a list of us, and then we have to always make sure we let everybody know how to contact everyone else in the family. But that moves generation to generation. So we're almost 100 years out from that time. They probably sold the property in the 40s or 50s. But we still retain the mineral rights to this day for the coal, the oil, and everything that's out there, the gas. Um, it's interesting because that's exactly the same thing out there. They have the coal and the mineral and all the different mineral rights that would be there on the property. So it's smart thinking of, I'll sell you the real estate, but the mineral rights are mine. So the mineral rights aren't like there's something mysterious you can't dig. It's about if you're going to dig, you have to let us know what you're digging for and why. And that's in the real estate contract. Um, it's, it's very funny because as soon as I saw that, I, 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 was, I always had that thought in my head, well, could it be about mineral rights? Because they might have not conveyed the mineral rights, which is the absolute truth, which is what Garth Meyer said is, we retain the mineral rights, they got the real estate rights to operate cattle and work on the property. I'm not saying I don't like the show, because I will watch season three. I love the show. I love the people that work on it. I like the characters. A lot about a show that's very interesting is the characters, the interplay of the characters, kind of what they show you. Skinwalker Ranch is cool because they dig holes, they use heavy equipment occasionally, they go out and do stuff, they fired off big rockets this last season. That's all cool stuff if you're a guy. So I'm kind of into it because they get to have fun. I see it as a fun thing. I'd love to go down and watch them film it or hang out. It's not so much for the experience because I kind of know what I'd be kind of looking at. Now I think there could be things as far as sort of normal physical um, reasons for a lot of the things that happen and what happens at those places. Um, I believe a lot of the stories and a lot of the stuff was made up. There was a mythology built. Um, the whole Skinwalker thing from the Navajo Indians in the area, I don't know why they even attach it, um, saying there's a Skinwalker in the area, but the show I don't think is ever, outside of talking a bit about the Navajo story, they've never addressed that in any way. Um, they don't even kind of lean that way and stuff. They, they kind of showed some petroglyphs and a few things, but the, they never kind of really attempt to kind of bring that into the story. And I think that was correct. It was a good call by them because I think that would just kind of further push the mythology because they always would have to explain that. Most of their scientific evidence that they claim from the past is all oral history. It's not actually documented hard evidence. Will we ever see Bigelow stuff? He had a newsletter from Nidge. You can go back. There's um, ways to get back and surf back in time and the internet. Some stuff was preserved and you can look at some of it. There was never really anything. George Knapp put more stuff out than anything else and he was friends with Bigelow and it's kind of a promotional thing. And it always makes you curious as a lot of the promotion of the place was it for the government funding to get the money and everybody benefited him. George Knapp certainly did. Some of the other people did. The people who worked there did. Bigelow did. He sold it. 
Brandon Fugel certainly is. So they're, they're all benefiting from this. So I don't really quite buy into the whole, you know, we're doing a YouTube thing. And yeah, we're not putting a ton into it. I, you know, I've, I've put, you know, ten twenty thousand dollars in equipment, but it's being used elsewhere for other projects. But again, I can look at it as like, eh, you know what we've done on YouTube, I'm not really making anything off of it. It's not benefiting me like those gentlemen are being benefited. So you can do it that way. If I had billions of dollars and the ability to do a program like that, man, I would be freely just kind of really saying, I want, I want the artistic license and control of this sucker and really tell the story. Like I said before, both sides of the coins, boys, let's do that. It's not going to happen because the network's going to want some control. The network and everybody that goes through television and film and that in that regard, they're just ingrained upon this storytelling scripted thing. And it's hard to break out of that because until you break into those new filmmakers that say, hey, we're just going to tell the story exactly how it is and kind of break away from that, which Robert May did do with Lust for Gold or Raising Against Time. He really did a nice job. A lot of that stuff just happened. But until we get that next generation of people or the networks or someone in the networks or something happens that we're able to move that way, I doubt it. I mean, Blair Witch, as awesome as that was, opened up a whole new avenue of fictional films based on something that's supposedly reality, documentary driven. So it started creating more, actually than helping programs, it helped open the door more for the reality TV, which at the time it would have been more docudrama. It was a documentary film and they try to work some drama into it and kind of navigate it. And now it's become something very different. But is it entertaining? Rather than most programs I see on television, I'd rather watch Oak Island. I'd rather watch, um, you know, uh, I just kind of went blank. But I'd rather watch a lot of those programs. Um, Skinwalker Ranch, Blind Frog Ranch, um, The Secrets of Atlantis. I'd rather watch those, Expedition Unknown. By the way, someone commented that I am the... Um, Josh Gates of the Superstition Mountains. I'll take it. So, but anyways, those programs are entertaining. Um, and that's their purpose and their rhyme and their reason. They sell advertising and they're entertaining. And I get that and the whole thing. And you have to kind of pay that way. So if you're going to educate, entertain people, you want to kind of get both messages across, you have to pay the piper. I'm not paying them with my silver coin, though. But... You have to pay the piper, and in that regard, you only have utilized so much control. If you're out there, have this wonderful idea, you really found some treasure that you need to push out, that whole story is getting watered down, compartmentalized, and changed, and challenged, because they want to put their product out there with their name on it. And I found that out the hard way, and I'm sure that happens with Skinwalker Ranch and Brandon Fugel, no matter how much money he has, and it happens with curse of oak island now that all being said let's kind of here at the end throw out that little weird kind of thing that kind of recently everybody's puzzled by history channel took all the videos down and for some reason our season one two three four five and six on youtube our no our season one episodes one through six on youtube were completely taken off and i thought oh okay they're done with us and then they re-released season one <laughs> season one episode one and it's sitting around getting close to 400,000 views boom bang and it's doing better than it did the first time out and I'm thinking hold it you know we're getting better YouTube views and stuff and, and obviously it helps this channel and, and it's a reflection for all and, I'm, and I appreciate that but then they released episode two and it's banging out there and everything's populated up and people are asking me a lot of questions what's this mean and I say I don't know I have absolutely no idea um, you would think if they had something out there with 300,000 views they would just let it ride um, there was a reason they brought everything down and brought it up is it to test the audience to see what the audience interest is which is obviously they're all flocking to season one episode one once they find out it's the same thing they saw before then they're jumping over to this channel here and starting to spread out and obviously god there's so many videos here we don't see the impact like that we see such a smaller impact because people generally start at the beginning and work their way to the end or start jumping around in there and with all the video content we have here it's like that but legend of superstition mountains is doing well on, on for some unknown reason so i don't know what it all means for you that have questions about that and stuff but um yeah we are in the last two two months legend of superstition mountains on youtube for the history channel um the episodes they just released in the last three four weeks 
are outperforming everything they've released in the last couple of months. So we're actually the hottest thing on their YouTube channel. And I have no idea. Are they rebooting with a bunch of other guys? Are they going to be ringing me on my phone? Um, are they going to even be interested in any talk? I pitched the idea of get us all together for one program for an hour or two and just pitch the idea of just what we're up to, what we've been doing in the meantime, and talk about some of the stuff that we've showed you guys that we're doing and kind of cover that a little bit. And if there's enough audience reaction, maybe you want to do something or reboot it with some other people, I could care less. But I thought that was a cool idea and for a lot of people, for us to also get the chance on the program to say thank you to all the people that have been wonderful and supporting and, and been so cool to us. I mean, even the trolls. I mean, you guys even come around. I mean, the trolls will even sit there and bash us and bag us and then they turn around and go, hey, what? You know, you guys are actually kind of cool. Thanks. You know, you guys got a sense of humor. So even the trolls, I think. But it, it, it's been a cool thing and, I, and it wouldn't, you know, they have control of what they want to do with that on History Channel. And if they wanted to further it, I would have a feeling it would be something hokier. It would be totally scripted and it would have very little involvement of anyone from a Dutch hunting background. And if it did, it was just guys going in there wanting paid and wanting their 15 minutes of fame. It wouldn't be all a bunch of people like the first time around that kind of got sucked into something they didn't expect. So it would be a very different program. I'm not going to bash it. I would be... I probably would be supportive of it because it's it's going to help, you know, it's always going to help with the mythology and the legend and the truth, hopefully in some way. So that's it for this week. Two sides of the coin. We'll kind of continue some of this later and stuff. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, Kind of, I know we got into a theme with the chupacabras and stuff and some of this stuff, and I promised some other things, and I'm going to kind of circulate those. I'll try to probably play some catch up here, get my lighting figured out, some way to get a little light up under the hat, right? Because Trevor's going to complain about that. But uh, hey, you know, production is what production is, and I hope this thing turns out well. You hear everything well, the audio is great, and all, but I'll be setting this off tonight, and Trevor will be patching it together and fixing it up and putting it out there. Hopefully, everybody enjoys it. Thank you everyone for watching. Please take care. Catch us all the time here. Catch the notifications. Go back, review stuff, ask questions. We don't care. Buy a t-shirt. Meet us at the Ronde, 5th, 6th, 7th of November at the Don's Camp out in the superstition mountains of Arizona. Please pick up Lust for Gold, Race Against Time. If nothing else, go to Lust for Gold, against Gold. Race Against Time. Go to their Facebook page or their website and, you know, and sign up for the sweepstakes. Four days, three nights in the Superstition Mountains. Pretty cool trip. Until the next time, I'm Wayne Tuttle. You're not. And have a good one. Take care.